Hi, this is Rebecca and Camille. And in this video, we will discuss the physiology of pulsus paradoxus with a focus on cardiac tamponade. We're going to start with a case. A patient arrives to the MICU with undifferentiated shock. He is a 56-year-old man with metastatic non-small cell lung carcinoma. A bedside echocardiogram demonstrates a large pericardial effusion. You are concerned about cardiac tamponade and want to evaluate the patient for pulsus paradoxus. By the end of this video, you will be able to define pulsus paradoxus, describe the physiology underlying the normal inspiratory decrease in systolic blood pressure, apply those principles in the setting of pulsus paradoxus in cardiac tamponade, and understand how to measure a pulsus paradoxus. But what is a pulsus paradoxus? Pulsus paradoxus is defined by an inspiratory decrease in systolic blood pressure that is greater than 10 millimeters of mercury. Well, why is that a paradox? That's a great point. It's not a paradox. It's an exaggeration of the normal physiology. So let's begin by exploring the normal physiology. Why does systolic blood pressure decrease on inspiration? When we inhale, the diaphragm moves downwards, creating a negative intrapleural pressure. This pulls the lungs open and causes air to move into the alveoli. Similarly, this negative intrapleural pressure also affects the heart and blood vessels. The negative pressure pulls open the blood vessels, drawing blood into the right ventricle, resulting in increased venous return. So how does this impact the blood pressure? To understand this interaction, we will illustrate the heart as a cross-section in the parasternal short axis view. Here you can see the left ventricle and the right ventricle are separated by the interventricular septum. This is highlighted in yellow. You can also see the pericardium surrounding the heart in pink. As described before, when we inhale, there is an increase in venous return to the right side of the heart. As the right ventricle fills, the free wall will expand outward and when limited by the pericardium, push against the intraventricular septum. If the septum bows into the left ventricle, this can impair LV filling and result in a reduced left ventricular end diastolic volume. This interaction is called intraventricular dependence. Now we will talk about the second concept, increased pulmonary venous pooling. Before, we focused on the changes resulting in increased venous return with inspiration. Now we will look at the impact of inspiration on the extra alveolar pulmonary vasculature. During inspiration, as air rushes into the chest and the lung inflates, the lung volume increases. This affects not only the airways, but also the pulmonary vasculature. Let's look at a cross-section of a pulmonary vein to explain what happens. Remember that the pulmonary veins are tethered to the lung parenchyma. So, during inspiration, as the parenchyma expands, the pulmonary vessels are pulled open and get bigger. As the radius of the pulmonary vessels increases, so does the capacitance. This results in venous pooling in the pulmonary veins. This is related to Ohm's law, V equals IR, where R is resistance. Remember, resistance is inversely proportional to the radius to the fourth power. So, as the radius increases, resistance decreases and flow to the pulmonary veins increases. So, during inspiration, the pulmonary veins act like a reservoir. But, it's important to note that although there is increased blood flow to the pulmonary veins, the flow out of the pulmonary veins is actually decreased, so the left ventricular and diastolic volume is lower. Let's summarize what we've learned so far about the normal change in systolic blood pressure with inspiration. First, during inspiration, the right ventricle expands, and intraventricular dependence causes decreased left ventricular filling. Second, expansion of the lungs during inspiration leads to venous pooling in the pulmonary vasculature, and this leads to decreased left ventricular preload. So both processes result in a decrease in the left ventricular and diastolic volume. Looking at the Starling curve, we can see that a decrease in the left ventricular and diastolic volume has the potential to change cardiac output if you are on the steep part of the curve. Under normal circumstances, however, we live on the flat part of the Starling curve, so the reduction in the left ventricular and diastolic volume during inspiration is not clinically significant and only results in a minimal change in the cardiac output and systolic blood pressure. However, when a pericardial effusion is present, this physiology is exaggerated and can result in a pulsus paradoxus. Let's explore this physiology in the presence of a pericardial effusion. First, we will return to the concept of interventricular dependence. As a reminder, this is a cross-sectional view of the heart, similar to the parasternal short-axis view. 
Surrounding the heart is the pericardium in pink, and within the pericardial space, there is now a large effusion in green. When the pericardium cannot stretch further to accommodate the effusion, the effusion exerts an inward pressure against the myocardium and limits expansion and filling of the cardiac chambers. As we said before, during inspiration, there is increased venous return to the right ventricle. However, because of the effusion, the RV free wall cannot expand outward to accommodate this increased preload. As a result, the RV pushes the interventricular septum towards the LV, decreasing the LV cavity size, thus decreasing LV preload, reducing LV stroke volume, and cardiac output. Okay, so I understand that intraventricular dependence affects cardiac output and systolic blood pressure. But don't we say that tamponade is a preload-dependent state? Shouldn't the increase in RV preload lead to an increase in LV preload? Good point. To answer this, let's look at a two-box model of the heart. The RV and LV exist in series. So in order for the volume that has been in the RV to reach the LV, it must travel first through the pulmonary vasculature. The time it takes for the blood to flow between the RV and the LV is called the transit time. So the LV does not instantaneously experience the increase in blood volume that is brought into the RV during inspiration. In fact, based on the transit time, this extra volume reaching the LV does not typically occur until the patient is actively exhaling. Therefore, it appears that the systolic blood pressure is higher at the end of exhalation. The timing of this, of course, depends on the cardiac and respiratory cycles lining up and can vary. Okay, I see. So there's a delay between when the RV experiences an increase in preload and when the LV experiences that same increase. Yes, you can think of this as delayed gratification. Okay, but doesn't the issue of transit time apply to all patients? I thought we started by saying that normal physiology is exaggerated in tamponade. So why is this different? Yes, the key is that in the setting of tamponade, all of the cardiac chambers are smaller due to compression by the effusion. So all of the end diastolic volumes are smaller. As a result, the LV is on the steep portion of the Starling curve where small changes in preload have a substantial effect on the stroke volume and cardiac output and therefore the blood pressure. Now that we understand the physiology, let's demonstrate how to measure a pulse's paradoxus. There are three main ways to do this. First, with a blood pressure cuff and a stethoscope. Second, with a blood pressure cuff and a Doppler. And third, with an arterial line. For this demonstration, we'll use a blood pressure cuff and a Doppler. Let's go get our supplies. Place the blood pressure cuff along the medial surface of the upper arm. Then, use the Doppler to identify the pulsations of the brachial artery. You may need an assistant to hold the Doppler in place during the procedure. Now I will inflate the blood pressure cuff until no pulsations are heard. Then I will slowly deflate the cuff, listening for the return of pulsations. To determine if the pulsations are dependent on the phase of the respiratory cycle, I will ask our participant to inhale. When the participant inhales, the sounds disappear. This occurs at approximately 102 millimeters of mercury. I will now deflate the cuff further, listening for continuous sounds throughout the respiratory cycle. You can hear this at a pressure of 96 millimeters of mercury. For our participant, the difference between these two pressures is 6 millimeters of mercury. When the difference is greater than 10 millimeters of mercury, this is considered abnormal and called a pulses paradoxus. A pulses measured greater than 10 millimeters of mercury has excellent test characteristics for the diagnosis of cardiac tamponade and the setting of a pericardial effusion, with a sensitivity of 98%, a specificity of 70%, and a positive likelihood ratio of 3.3. We've covered a lot in this video, so let's review the key points. 
First, there is a mild decrease in systolic blood pressure during inspiration, and that's normal. This is mediated by interventricular dependence, pulmonary venous pooling, and transit time through the pulmonary vasculature. In cardiac tamponade, restricted ventricular filling exaggerates the normal physiology, resulting in a greater difference between inspiratory and expiratory systolic blood pressures. Measuring a pulsus paradoxus is a useful clinical skill that may be helpful in diagnosing cardiac tamponade. Rebecca, I just measured the pulses on our patient and it's 15. I'm going to go call cardiology. Better go. Thanks for watching our video.